webinar, uh, Raising Daniels, uh, Godly Lessons for Modern Times, um, is going to start. But I wanted to be sure that I uh, opened up the uh, opportunity to to log in. And so if, if you're here and if you for any reason would like to uh, be able to uh, uh, chat, there is a group chat over here on, on the right hand side. And so if any time you have a question, you're welcome to go ahead and list that out there now. And so uh, later today, after the broadcast is done, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send out an, an email with a replay link. So <clears throat> if anybody was, uh, for whatever reason, not able to log in, then you'll be able to, to get in. So I'm just going to simply uh, uh, work on a couple of things here for the next couple of minutes. And in the meantime, uh, hopefully you can relax, get yourself a Coke, a cup of coffee, or what have you, and uh, we'll start very soon in a couple of minutes. Again, my name is David Lanson. I appreciate having you here. All right. Well, um, again, this is David Lance, and uh, so we're getting ready to to start the webinar, Raising Daniels, Godly uh, Lessons for Modern Times. Uh, just as a way of introduction, um, uh, I uh, am a uh, college adjunct professor. I teach economics, political science, and a few other things. But I've always had a lifelong passion of looking at the Bible, especially the Old Testament, and relating that to uh, what's going on in our lives. And so I thank you for, for showing up for the webinar. And without further ado and wasting any of your time, uh, we'll go ahead and guess, get started. I do want to mention on the right-hand side, if you have a comment, uh, if you'd like to post it, please feel free to do that. There is a bit of a lag with Google Hangouts, so if you post something, it may not show up for a minute or so. Uh, don't be concerned. For that reason, uh, if there's any questions, I'll be sure to answer them at the uh, toward the tail end of this. And also, um, uh, just to keep in mind, I'll be sending out a, a replay link for this later on and have some links to the things that I'm going to mention in terms of availability uh, throughout our conversation this afternoon. Um, so one of the things to think about is why the prophet Daniel? Well, he was known to be a godly man, and he found himself in the land of Babylon, uh, a land full of pagans. And so one of the things that people worry about these days is raising their, um, their teenage Age, uh, sons and daughters in a world in which um, uh, morality seems to be declining. In fact, in a Gallup poll uh, of May of this year, earlier this uh, this this uh, this year, Americans were asked to rate mor U.S. moral values, and they've consistently rated our morality in this country poorly. But 81% say that the state of moral values is only fair or poor. And another 77% say that the state of moral values is getting worse in America. Now, one 
can leg legitimately point to, to many reasons, and my purpose today is to not try to dig into that, but simply to point that out. And if, if you're a student of the Bible, then you know that in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 7, something that is called the Shema, it begins by saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And it, it asks us then to impress these lessons on uh, our children to, to speak about them all the time. And whether it's modern times or ancient times, families have, have always been concerned about this. Now certainly back in, in ancient times, uh, you might sit around the campfire um, and tell stories and tell wonderful stories. You know, I have uh, three grandchildren and they do like to hear my corny stories uh, that I tell them. But let's face it, in a modern world, there's awful lot of things that they could be doing. And frankly, many adults these days are not as well versed in the Bible as they might like to be. And so therefore, they're perhaps reluctant to tell those kinds of stories and and also not sure how to make those stories interesting because we adults sometimes have a hard time doing that. And so the question is, what do we do? Well, maybe what we do is we decide to drop the kids off at church, leave them with the youth director or with the Sunday school class teachers or whatever, and we uh, think that perhaps our churches are doing a good job, but eventually the kids grow up. Uh, they go off to college or they leave home, and uh, perhaps they find themselves awash in, in a culture that wants them to conform to the culture and not to godly principles. And perhaps we feel surprised that these people then end up not following the Word of God like we thought they would when they were kids living at home with us. Well, if you think of the Bible, we, we know of Daniel in the Bible. And we also know that the Babylonians wanted to change his name. And so they renamed him uh, Belteshazzar. Now, uh, why is it that we know him, however, as Daniel and not as Belteshazzar? Well, it's because Daniel remained distinct in the culture. He followed God. Now, we also know about his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that uh, walked in the fiery furnace and survived that. But for some reason, we don't know those three men's Hebrew names. We only know them by their Babylonian names. And I want to suggest to you that the Babylonians, one reason why they renamed people was because they wanted to make those people conform to their culture. And so while I'm sure Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were followers of God, we don't know them by their Hebrew names. We know them by their Babylonian names. And some of that paganness, so to speak, rubbed off onto them, not so much in the case of Daniel. And so uh, maybe what we need to do is we need to look at new metaphors to help bring God's ancient wisdom alive in terms of how we can communicate the truth of the Bible in a modern age. We desperately need to raise up Daniels and Esthers uh, who can be salt and light in, in the culture in which we live, including the college campus. And so if, if you're into uh, various movies, this is a particular uh, picture from the movie Back to the Future. Uh, what we need to do is remind ourselves that church isn't what it used to be in 1955. Now, perhaps if, if you're a student of the Bible and apologetics, you've heard the name of Francis Schaeffer. He's written a lot of books, in, including his first one, The God Who Is There. But most people, and, and frankly, I have to include myself in this, are not very familiar with his teachings. Well, in section four of his book, The God Who Is There, he has a section titled, Speaking Historic Christianity, into the 20th century climate. You see, even back in the 1950s and 1960s, Francis Schaeffer saw something happening in, in modern culture, in modern America, in Western Europe, that was affecting our knowledge of the Bible and how we could communicate that. And I want to suggest to you today in the webinar that uh, using movies, uh, uh, historical Christian fiction, and other sorts of tools are a way for us to connect modern events to ancient times. There's a phrase that I like. It's called, God, the moral God, is active in human history on behalf of his people. Do you know that in Babylon, they had the story of Gilgamesh, and there was a story of the flood, just like we have of Noah in the Bible. In the, in the story of Gilgamesh, the flat, flood 
it lasts for seven days. And when Gilgamesh, or excuse me, when Unapishtum uh, lights a fire to sacrifice the gods, it says that they descended like flies to eat the sacrifice because they were so hungry. And the gods therefore decided that they would never again destroy man because they needed man to feed them. They needed man to serve them. But however, God in the Bible loved mankind punished mankind because of its sinfulness because God wanted us to be moral people and he promised Noah and his and his and his family and the descendants of not only humanity but of all flesh that he would never again do what he did in terms of the flood because God the moral God is active in human history on behalf of his people that's a different type of God than any of the other ancient cultures would have ever known so one of the things, if you hang around with me to the end of the webinar, I'm going to provide you with a link to an ebook that I've created called Discovering Truth at the Movies. And uh, what I do is, is I have been, for the last 10 years or so, been using movies and TV shows to kind of launch a conversation with the culture about God and, and ask the question, what is truth? And that question is, of course, asked by Pontius Pilate to Christ in John 18, 37. And so that's a way that I have found that with younger folks, one can launch a conversation about moral values, the Bible, and current events. So here's today's agenda for the, the webinar that's going to go about a half an hour. I want to talk to three specific groups. Uh, first is um, parents and or kids in middle school or high school uh, and how one can use uh, books and assignments to have that conversation and dig into the scripture and relate it to modern events. Second, uh, I want to talk about college and post-college young adults. Um, they're sort of done with doing assignments, but they like to watch movies. And the other thing to realize is that um, every year, hundreds of thousands of American college students take courses online. I teach college courses myself, and I've, I've had thousands of students go through my online courses over the last uh, 14 years that I've been teaching. And so a lot of these folks out there are used to doing an online conversation. So a question is, how can you and I engage them in something that they're already doing to continue that conversation in social media? And so uh, one of the other things then is to ask for instructors, uh, young adult uh, group leaders or youth leaders, how can we be creative? How can we mix and match resources for either online uh, uh, resources, a course that I've created that I'll talk more about called Clash of the Superpowers? How do we teach? online. So uh, let's go back then to the middle school and the uh, high school age students to talk a little bit about that. You know, um, when, when I was a, a young person about middle school age, I remember that I began to get introduced to biographies. And I loved reading biographies, but what I, I didn't like was those books that were just all about people, places, events, uh, dates, and stuff, more like a, a recitation of facts. What I really liked were biographies that were more of a story that really drew me into that. And so um, uh, as I got older, I, I came across other books. In particular, when I was in sixth grade, my teacher, Miss Pletcher, would read some books to us. And one book that she read was called The Bronze Bow. This is set uh, during the time of Christ, and a boy named Daniel is, is tired of the Romans, and he wants to fight the Romans. And he's got this buddy who keeps telling him, they ought to go listen to this carpenter who's talking about love and stuff like that. And so I remember reading the book myself after uh, Miss Pletcher read it to us. And when I was a father myself, I have uh, three uh, grown children. And so I decided that I would read my students, uh, excuse me, my children, uh, that particular book. Well, as, as time went by in the early 2000s, somebody decided to create a study guide that would go with that. And, and so if you go out and if you Google a, a, a company called Progeny Press, you will find that they have a lot of study guides that go with books. Now, the Bronze Bow won the Newbery Award for Best in Children's Literature in 1962. I suspect they've used other uh, Newbery Awards for exactly that. And so today in homeschool communities, you see a lot of folks incorporating the, the reading of the Bronze Bow into literature studies and things of that nature. 
When I went on to be a college student at Butler University, I took an Old Testament literature course, and my uh, instructor there decided that he would have us read James Mishner's book, The Source. Uh, this novel is set in, an, in a Jewish uh, tell, a dig, and it goes down from the layers from the time of Abraham up to the time of Paul. And so, for the first time, I discovered that there were temple prostitutes associated with various pagan activities. And so, for example, uh, female prostitutes would sometimes shave their heads. And so out of that recognition, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the apostles and the prophets would say, in terms of the law, that a woman should have her head covered because they knew that having a head that was bald was associated with uh, the, the pagan idol worship. Another thing is that both male and female prostitutes would get tattoos. And so again, the stricture against tattoos was because of their use in idol worship. Now, having a conversation about women having their head covered or wearing tattoos in with today's young people can lead to some fascinating discussions and things of that nature. And so I would encourage you, if you're not aware of those things, to uh, dig into that sort of topic. And novels like that are wonderful things. Back in the late 1990s, I wrote a novel called The Brotherhood of the Scroll, and I was listening to, to Chuck Swindoll talking about an overview of the Old Testament. He said that Jeremiah would have been in his early 40s, Daniel and Ezekiel in their late teens, and possibly Daniel and Ezekiel were disciples of uh, an older Jeremiah. And so I just took that idea, wrote a novel. At the time, I was reading Tom Clancy novels, so I wanted to make it into an international spy uh, type of thing. And so um, uh, that's what I did. But along the way, I found a lot of historical things that went with that that I wove into my novel. And so uh, along the way, I had some friends say, you know, David, you ought to think about creating school assignments and things of that nature that go with that. Um, and so I began that process of, of doing that and want to touch on a couple of those kinds of things uh, today. Perhaps you've seen in the news recently, with all the talk about infrastructure, that the nation of China is looking at rebuilding what's known as the ancient Silk Road that Marco Polo traveled. They're calling it their One Belt one road mega project and i encourage you to google that um, as i did and i found this map so i put it into uh, the thing and so they're looking at uh, reconnecting the the old silk road that kind of went th along and brought you over here to china and uh, so that's one of the things that china is looking at doing what you may not know is that that Silk Road that Marco Polo used was also known as the Royal Road and was also a caravan site used in ancient Bible times. And so, in fact, what you see here is um, as you trace uh, what's sometimes called the Via Maris, the Way of the Sea, that was around in the time of Christ. So this was a, a trade route that uh, caravans would have taken to get to Egypt, but they would go up here into what is today modern Syria, uh, up near where the Euphrates River is, and then continue on, and that became part of that Silk Road complex. And here is a place called Carchemish. There was a battle fought there between Babylon and Egypt in the year 605 BC about the same time that Jeremiah began his prophecy that Judah would be taken into captivity to Babylon for 70 years. Also at the same time, Nebuchadnezzar's father, Nebuchadnezzar, died, and so Nebuchadnezzar becomes king. Those three events all happen in the year, depending on how you date it, 604 or 605 BC. What you may not realize is that in, in the current war that's going on in Syria, there's a place called Aleppo that has pretty much been decimated. And that city of Aleppo is virtually on top of where the ancient battle and the ancient city of Carchemish is located. And so we can imagine how trade routes were used in ancient times, and those same trade routes are around today, and even China is using them. So here's another thought for you. Uh, this is, goes back to that uh, uh, project from, from China. And notice that they have the trade route. And we would think of this going through what's called the Suez Canal. Well, guess what? The ancient Egyptians thought of it first. 
when I was writing my novel, The Brotherhood of the Scroll, I thought it would be really cool to have this mega project going on. And I just imagined that, okay, we'll have Egypt building a canal. And But I didn't have any idea that they actually had done that. And in 601 BC, Pharaoh Nietzsche conceived of the idea of putting a canal in what was called the Wadi Tumlet. So connecting a portion of the Nile River over a, a wadi, which is a shallow um, area that water flows, through the Bitter Lakes down into the Red Sea. And I discovered that by looking at a book that I found in the library, Egypt, Canaan, and Israel in Ancient Times. And I also found a website from which this particular uh, image is taken, where they had everything about ancient e Egypt. And for me, it was a fascinating time as I put together the plot line in my novel. Well, as I mentioned, I had a homeschool parent who encouraged me to look at putting this into a lesson format. And so this is one of the lessons that comes from my uh, course, Clash of the Superpowers, where they would read the first three chapters in the novel, and then they would also uh, have a, uh, a lesson from the, the booklet, Clash of the Superpowers. They'd have some vocabulary and matching and short essay uh, quiz assessments. And depending on if there was a high school age group, they might have an essay assignment. And also, there were various scripture lessons uh, that they would read, and I would encourage you to, to write down for a later reading uh, after this webinar, Jeremiah chapter 25, and from 35 and 36, and also from chapter 46. And, and so that would give you some historical background of what's going on then. And then read the story of Daniel in chapter 1 and Esther in chapter 4, and think about the moral problems that they would have faced in those ancient times. Uh, imagine an assignment where you have to do a, a, a paper on trade routes used in an ancient model t modern times, and then also look at uh, issues with regard to discussion questions that relate to all of that. Well, at any rate, uh, I developed uh, the, the course back in 2014, and so uh, that went on to uh, uh, be something I call Clash of the Superpowers. And towards the end of the sem uh, webinar, I'll give you a coupon code that you can use to get 50% off on that uh, particular course. And so let's move on to talking about college and post-college uh, age young people. Uh, one of the things that uh, we realize is that uh, it's important to try to engage them in a conversation about biblical truth. Uh, but sometimes that's hard to do. What I've discovered is the use of movies is a great way to do that. And so perhaps uh, you've seen a movie called Knowing. It stars Nicolas Cage, and he is an astrophysicist in that movie. And if you were to go on YouTube later on and, and look for a scene called Determination versus randomness. Uh, there's about a two and a half minute video where he's talking about are things kind of already planned out or is everything in the universe random? Now I encourage you if you if you uh, are into this sort of thing to watch the entire movie knowing but be sure that before you read it you read 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 10 to 13 because the ending of that movie is an awful lot like what Peter discusses there in, in 2 Peter chapter 3. Well, um, movies are something that we can use. Um, what did the ancients do? Did they have anything similar that they might have used to have a conversation about God? Well, in Acts chapter 17, verse 28, Paul quotes from the Sicilian poet, poet Erastus, Erodotus. And Erodotus was a, a, a person who lived around 300 BC, and he wrote something called the poem of Zeus. Now, this was a poem uh, that... Uh, Paul quotes in Acts 17, 28. You see, Paul used his knowledge of Greek culture to explain the gospel to those uh, people in metaphors that they could understand. And so if you read Romans 16, 20, you'll see that it says, the God of, of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Well, again, the Greeks would have realized that their hero Hercules, the constellation Hercules, sometimes in the northern sky has his foot resting above the head of Draco, uh, and that represents one of the stories from the 12 labors of Hercules. And so they would have been very familiar with this sort of thing. And so Paul used the story of the stars to, to relate the gospel message to them. 
This helps us then to understand better what Paul writes in first uh, in Romans chapter one, verses 18 to 19, where he says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. And so we see that Paul and the other uh, uh, prophets and so forth use the language of the culture to communicate um, a concept of a Hebrew or a Jewish God to a uh, first a Greek and then to a Roman mind. Well, one of the things that I do on a monthly basis is I write a newsletter called Conversations with the Culture. And so what I do is I take movie scenes and I usually make a meme uh, like this one. This is from uh, the movie The Matrix, uh, where it's the famous uh, choice, do I choose the red pill or the blue pill? And uh, so uh, one of the things to realize that in that movie, right after it, uh, Neo, uh, um, who is the character there in, in the sunglasses, is sucked out of an incubator sort of thing and into a, a, a tub of water. It's sort of like being born again. And so if you're a familiar with the movie, then you realize that this idea of being born again is a natural follow-on to the decision to choose the red pill and see how deep the rabbit hole goes. And so uh, if you are interested in getting an ebook where I've got 50 of those uh, conversations with the culture, complete with discussion questions that you can have for high school or college or post-college uh, young people, you can go to www.wisejargon.com. Throw a slash in there and the capital letter O. So it's old site slash discovering truth dot PDF. Be sure that you capitalize O for old, S for site, D for discovering and T for truth and put it all together and uh, you'll be able to download that, that free ebook that I just mentioned. Another thing, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is, is that a lot of college students are taking online courses. And so I have a course out there called How to, to Teach Online, and I include uh, discussions from a four-week uh, test thing that I did in a Yahoo news group for that very purpose. And I've worked with organizations like uh, One Mission Society to show their missionaries how to do online discussions to share the gospel. And so one of those things that I have is discussion questions related to the book of Jeremiah using uh, my clash of the superpowers and so then having discussion questions uh, that we can then follow up on. And so one of the other things, for example, um, the ancients had a god named Moloch, sometimes also called Chemosh or Dagon, in which babies were burned in the fire. And so when the prophet Jeremiah talks about uh, in, uh, having uh, innocent blood, this is what he's referring to. And so uh, we can perhaps relate that to the issue of today with the right to life movement and other things. And so uh, one of the things to keep in mind then is that using any of these sorts of tools, we can then begin to say, how do I uh, apply this and, and become creative if I'm an instructor working with youth, uh, uh, young adults, or even, even older people that are young at heart? Well, uh, if, if you're a teacher like me, then you enjoy creating lessons, you love to feel the reward when a student has that aha moment, and you've probably learned to be creative. You've learned to mix and match resources, and so that's one of the things that I encourage people to do. I want to mention a, a man by the name of John Clayton. He actually now today lives in Niles, Michigan, and I'm not sure exactly how old he was, but when I was a college student at Indiana University, I went to listen to him. He was an atheist. He was a scientist. He was actually in, in uh, geology, and uh, he wanted to do one of those things, you know, where he wanted to just prove that God did not exist. Well, uh, like a lot of folks, uh, Lee Strobel and folks like that, he became a Christian. And then he created a program called Does God Exist? And now, and now he has a website for that because, you know, back in the early 1980s, we didn't even have the Internet. So you can go out there and he's got online courses. He's got videos. He's got children's materials. And he, he makes uh, visits to places. He left teaching at the college level to become a science teacher at the high school level and won the Teacher of the Year Award uh, when he was teaching in South Bend, Indiana, which is a, a town in northern Indiana. So I would highly encourage you to check out his uh, resources as another place to go to find things to mix and match with curriculum ideas that you might have.
I mentioned earlier my course, Clash of the Superpowers. Um, now, the, the list price is only $40, but this will give you the opportunity to get 50% off if when you go to https colon backslash backslash and then generation self employed dot zendler z e n l e r dot com and then slash courses slash clash of the superpowers don't forget those little hyphens and you enter the word half off and so uh, you can use that course uh, as a standalone course course i've got a syllabus i've got assignments and everything else or you can mix and match it with other things that you're doing you can use it as a bible study and forget doing the assignments uh, you can use it for middle school uh, kids and just use the quizzes and not the full essays or if you're teaching high school do that or if you're a, a college bible professor maybe you you blend that in with a like a two or three week segment when you're looking at say the exilic period and, and the exile of the Jews from, from Jerusalem to Babylon. Well, I hope that this uh, webinar has been helpful and given you some things to think about. You can uh, contact me e email-wise at generationselfemployed at gmail.com. That's generationselfemployed at gmail.com. And uh, one of the other things uh, is that a little while today, give me a half an hour to an hour, and I will send out a, a link uh, for a replay link so that you can watch this again, share it with somebody that perhaps you'd like to share it with, or if you were one of those folks that was not able to get into uh, the, the, uh, uh, the live uh, cast, then you'll be able to go back and replay this to your heart's content. Um, so um, I thank you so much for your time. I'm going to wait a minute or so because, as I mentioned uh, at the uh, beginning of this, there is a bit of a lag. And so um, you may not hear what I'm saying right now for the next, oh, say, 90 seconds. So again, thank you for your time. And uh, I will hang on here for a minute or two to see if there's any other follow-up questions. Oh, one person did have a, a question, and, and that is in the video I mentioned uh, that um, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego kind of got absorbed by the culture and, they, and, and so on. And what I meant by that was simply not that they didn't follow God, but because we know them by their Babylonian names, they became absorbed by that pagan culture and and so one of the things um if you're a, if you've ever been a parent then you know the joy of naming your child and you want to pick a name that you think will reflect their character and their personality god changes the name of hoshia to joshua which goes from meaning salvation that's what hoshia meant to joshua which means the lord is salvation and so in that way we communicate something about that individual when the Babylonians changed the Hebrew names to a Babylonian name, they were wanting to basically have them forget about their Jewishness and make them Babylonian um, in, in both character and, and moral content. And so uh, because we know those three guys by their Babylonian names, uh, some of that paganness did rub off on them, at least on first blush. So I hope that's a, a little bit helpful with regard to that. Now you get to see a little bit what I actually look like uh, in real life. Well, again, I want to thank you all for, for joining in today. And uh, again, you can contact me to follow up. Um, have a blessed day, and if you're somewhere in the Midwest, we're uh, enjoying the rain left over from uh, the... Uh, uh, tropical storm Cindy that's now passing through uh, the state of Indiana. Thanks so much and God bless.